Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Tuesday Refresher. My name is Jim Chastain, and um, you're welcome to contribute to the discussions today by submitting questions or comments. We may not have time to uh, answer them online, but everything would be will be answered uh, via email. We usually start each session with a poll question. Today, it's less technical than normal, but I would appreciate your feedback as, uh, as well. It has to do with our newsletter, and we would appreciate, uh, again, the feedback if you would be so kind. So first of all, do you find the, uh, the newsletter useful, and how often do you uh, check it out? And so if you would please help us out with uh, some feedback. Uh, again, we have, actually have an announcement on the website uh, later in the session. So uh, we do listen, and we are in a mode of uh, trying to be responsive. So appreciate your feedback to this question. Let's leave it open for another five seconds. And here's how folks are responding to the newsletter. And uh, that's encouraging. And then the uh, next question is, how often do you actually visit the website? It turns out we've ac we're actually launching a new website uh, this week. And so uh, I would encourage everyone to check it out. And uh, the intent is to make the information more accessible and uh, searchable such that you don't have to wade through a lot of uh, confusing dialogues. Here's how everyone has responded on that question. Thank you very much. Okay, so in terms of what we're doing today, we're going to be uh, spending some time modeling some DC systems in Easy Power. Uh, then we'll be going through the DC arc flash analysis. We're going to touch on lightly the difficulty. Uh, when you're modeling a hybrid system or, or a low voltage DC system, and uh, it turns out there's a fair amount of movement in the industry in terms of what the modeling or the accuracy of the model being used. So uh, stay tuned as we kind of get into the more, more details. So to start with, uh, the assumptions that we want to make in DC, now it's worthy of note that Easy Power. In the Easy Power Arc Flash suite, you can model AC systems, DC systems, and hybrid systems. And so that's all at the same time, which gives you a lot of ability to see the interaction interdependence in your, uh, especially in your hybrid system. So short circuit currents are modeled with steady state approximate value in a DC. Distributed circuit inductance and capacitance are not modeled. The motors uh, contribute to a bus fault. Loads do not. Fault current from rectifiers at the terminal specified in, rect uh, in the rectifier dialog. The DC uses an average value for voltage and current as compared to the AC RMS value. And then EC, uh, Easy Power implements the maximum power method as described in NFPA 70E. And uh, that's just kind of the baseline that we're working from. So these are the elements that are uh, available in the DC equipment library or equipment palette. And the, uh, the DC bus fault under short circuit conditions on the bus, the rectifier actually pulls current from the AC system. So depending upon the location of the fault in the DC system, that may have an impact or not. If the fault is directly on the DC bus of the inverter, then a bolted three-phase fault appears on the AC side with little or no distortion. Consequently, the, the fault current is then limited by the system Thevenin and short circuit impedance and the equivalent resistance of the thyristor or diode, uh, diode bridge. So if the fault is located some distance from the rectifier after a DC cable, then both the AC and DC side fault currents will not be fully bolted and we'll have an intermediate condition where only a transient simulation could determine the fault level. Well, this and the fact that the DC side current has excessive ripple lead to assigning such simulations um, which are presently beyond the scope of the Easy Power 
uh, ArcFlash model. And uh, so consequently, the under short circuit conditions on the AC output bus, again, the AC and DC systems respond to the fault. And uh, what the response is completely dependent upon the output frequency of the variable frequency device and the inverter. So the fault, as it appears on the DC bus, can create extreme ripple with a waveform characteristic that's not easily understood. For a variable frequency device with diodes or thyristor front end and a thyristor output, the fault uh, will even manifest on the input of the AFD. So again, a simulation with transient simula um, with a transient simulation of the rectifier and inverter bridge is essential to simulate such fault conditions. So in terms of the components that we're going to be used in the model, we're going to have energy sources uh, that would be generators, PV systems, batteries, and rectifiers, and then DC loads and motors, and the motor can act as a short circuit during uh, the fault. The components that need to be included will be the cables, rectifiers and inverters, and then protective devices. Simplified electrical characteristics of the DC motor is effectively uh, dependent upon the armature current, armature resistance, and the induced armature voltage, or back EMF, which will add up to be the terminal uh, voltage. So during a fault, the DC motor short circuit contribution ends up being dependent upon the equation here, which we're showing current equal the uh, system voltage divided by the impedance of the resistor of the uh, armature. Now that's not always easily, if, you, if the manufacturer doesn't give it to you, that's not always easy to estimate. And so just as an example, if uh, we're looking at uh, 250 volt motors or 230 volt DC motors, we can look at a sampling of the, uh, the impedance ratio versus the horsepower and we plot these values to give us an approximation of what the uh, percent impedance is for whatever size motor we're going to use. And then, then to estimate the resistance, the armature resistance, we take the motor horsepower dividing the uh, resistance by that voltage and full load current ratio. And in the case of a 20 horsepower motor, we're looking at about uh, 138 mil ohms for, uh, for the armature resistance. And so we'll be using that in the, in the model. Likewise, for a battery, we model the battery as being a voltage source and an internal resistance. Typical bat uh, battery types will give typical resistances of anywhere from 2% to 15%. And uh, just as a reference point, we uh, pick, the, pick these numbers off of the uh, website from uh, solarelectric.com. So if we're going to calculate a typical battery resistance, say for a flooded lead-acid battery at 240 volts, if it's rated at 200 amp hour with an 8-hour discharge time, and if we assume 10% uh, impedance from that uh, lookup table, we show that the resistance for the battery will be the voltage divided by the rated amps and a per-unit impedance uh, base and we get roughly one ohm internal resistance for a lead acid battery under these conditions. Now in terms of uh, photovoltaic characteristics, it's a typical semiconductor curve. We have the uh, vertical axis. We locate the y-intercept, which will be the short circuit current. And it's approximately 10% greater than the rated, total rated current, current of the device. And then on the bottom right, down here, we have the x-intercept. And that's going to be the, the open circuit voltage, which is roughly 10% higher than the rated voltage. And then as we mentioned earlier, short circuit uh, rectifiers can be uh, represent or convey a line side short circuit equivalent in uh, AC amps for a contribution during the fault.
and this will depend upon where the fault happens on our uh, proximity to the rectifier. So just as kind of a trivia question, there's really not an IEEE established standard for DC arc flash. In 2012, NFPA 70E Appendix D published a model that was presented in a uh, IEEE committee paper in 2007. And again, in 2015, it, it appeared in Appendix D5 with the same model and reference and is referred to as a maximum power method. Well, it turns out there's there's been, surprisingly enough, as long as DC has been around and uh, studied, the, uh, the actual correlation between radiated energy and an arcing flash created in a DC environment have not, be, have not been well analyzed. And so just during the last uh, 18 to 24 months, there's been a fair amount of more cogent data and testing. And so this year we're expecting in the ESW meeting uh, some new models to be presented. And the bottom line is it's going to be a less conservative value, especially at the low voltages where we see DC in our systems today. So I'm not going to get too much into that uh, conservative side of it. We're just going to go with the model that we have. We're going to be touching on DC systems in a couple weeks during a refresher. And we'll have more information then uh, pertaining to some of these tests that uh, have a bearing on DC low voltage. So the maximum power method equations basically uh, tell us that the arcing current is 50% of the maximum bolted fault current and that the incident energy is uh, equal to this uh, second equation where we have the arcing current, the uh, system voltage, the estimated arc incident energy to maximum point, the system voltage in V, and the arcing time in seconds, and then the working distance squared. And then if we're looking or talking about a, a fault in an enclosure, there's a multiplication factor that varies based upon which study you're looking at, but it's roughly uh, a 3x type of uh, multiplication effect. All right, so we're going to uh, open up this system in uh, Easy Power and kind of walk through some of the applications of uh, what we just talked about, both in terms of, uh, of the different components and Easy Power's ability to analyze the system. So one, one other condition in terms of uh, controlling of the fault current time is the thyristor blocking under fault conditions, which you would find or we would find in the, the rectifier. Most likely a thyristor device will stop firing when it senses a short circuit condition. And this time is set up by the manufacturers and may be a software or hardware, hardware related parameter. And so this detail is typically left for uh, detailed transient simula simulations. So under conditions of a DC bus fault, most likely uh, the current limiting fuses, typically in series with each of the thyristors, would be the limiting factor. So given that the bridges can have both series and parallel combinations, uh, it, it pretty much is dependent upon what the manufacturer's data sheet says for overload uh, cutoff that we have to rely on. So let's jump into Easy Power and see how all this stuff looks. So we're, I'm, in, I'm in the database edit, and I want to look at a few of these components. Let's start with the motor. And again, as we set up a new motor in Easy Power, what, what it's going to ask for is the horsepower and the armature uh, impedance. Let's, let's just kind of do that. Now, one of the things you'll find is if you try to apply an AC equipment, piece of equipment to the DC side of the system, you will get uh, pulled up short, and uh, the tool will ask you if you know what you're doing. So 
So what we're looking for is the horsepower and the armature uh, uh, current or resistance. And based upon that, it, we can model, if you will, the, uh, the short circuit model for the motor. In Cables are pretty straightforward. Loads are strictly a DC uh, model that have no contribution uh, during a fault. And more and more equipment manufacturers for protective devices are producing DC only uh, breakers. And these can be found in the device library again under the manufacturer's name and description and the phase trip of where, where you will see the need to set the specific. Now the significance here, and I want to just point this out briefly, is that the normal operations operating current, in this case we have an 800 amp trip point for this breaker, we have the ability, or we have the need to identify a fault current that's much lower relative to the normal operating conditions of this breaker than we see in an AC side of the world. So normally a, a multi k circuit breaker is set for a 10x trip point compared to what the maximum setting is for the breaker. In this case, uh, we can see trip points set anywhere from 5, 4, or 5x the load current up to 10 times. So that, that can make the situation a little bit more complicated in terms of uh, trip time. All right, so those are our, and so, yeah, the rectifier. Again, the frequency that is being operated, the type of uh, bridge that's being used, and then the rated full load current, and then the fault time, these will be the conditions that uh, determine the protection that this circuit would offer the rest of our equipment and uh, its ability to handle a fault. So once we've got the model drawn, we go into short circuit focus. And again, the, the AC side of the world doesn't really change. Going to look at the arc, excuse me, let's just look at the fault current first. Now, half cycle current in on the AC side will change over time. Uh, but because we're talking about the, the uh, arcing current, and the DC side is going to be a constant value. So looking at different time slices doesn't change anything on the DC side where it does on the AC side. Then when we go to, to analyze the uh, arcing incident energy, we see calculations that include, and again, it makes this use of the range for arc flash icon even more valuable what we see is the indication of the protective device upstream, the um, maximum bolted fault current, and then the arcing current will, will be half of that bolted fault value. And then again, this is the trip time that the manufacturer indicated would be uh, handled in the, uh, the bridge itself. And so those are the conditions that are used in the maximum power calculations. If we were to fault this bus, we'd see that we have a, an upstream device BL1, which is actually providing the protective devices. The question arises, why doesn't BL2 get into the, the mix? And uh, that becomes, that lends more, or factors more into the conversation about the difficulty in trying to do coordination for low voltage systems. And so we're going to touch on that briefly, but we'll talk more about it in a couple of weeks. Likewise, if we have a, a localized fault at a remote load, we can see that we have a tripping device upstream and, and the calculations are being done based upon bolted fault current, the 50% point, and then the trip time afforded by that protective device. So this brings up uh, the question of how valuable the coordination module is and some of its capability. And uh, although we've talked about it prior to this, probably the single most valuable part of this discussion 
is how important a sequence of events capability can be when you're looking at low voltages where you can have fault currents that aren't necessarily quenched by protective devices. So let's just take a real quick look at that. If we look at the uh, current levels in our coordination module and we fall to, let's say, a remote bus, it'll give us the current for that branch and then the contribution currents from the remote buses and the remote sources of current. So if we have a fault on this particular bus, we're going to see some AC contribution, or at least some contribution from the rectifier during the first half cycle, and uh, some feedback from the sister loads or the motors that are included on the bus. Now, what does that tell us in terms of sequence of events? If we go to the uh, sequence of events icon here on the bottom row at the top, again, with a single bus fault and indicating half cycle current, we see that this tripping device immediately upstream will trip at 15 milliseconds. The next upstream device will trip in 35 milliseconds. Now, BL1 is indicating that it'll trip at 25 milliseconds. So there's an indication here of miscoordination. And yet, there may be not much we can do about it if we take a real quick look at the, uh, the TCC curves. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's um, include our motor, our cables, protective devices, and uh, the upstream elements and plot everything. And what we see as a result is uh, BL4 is doing its thing as far as protecting our uh, fault. If we fall just a single bus, we can see the maximum currents that are going through those uh, breakers. And Knowing that BL4 is going to be the tripping device, we can make sure I got the right one. So it's, it's this blue breaker. I can insert the arcing current. And if you can see it, what I got is this little triangle right here, which will trip as it crosses this blue curve, which indicates BL4. Now, it's clear from here this that we're going to have some amount of miscoordination. And unfortunately, we don't have the ability because these may be uh, thermal magnetic devices. We may not have the ability to do adjustments. If we look at BL2, which is the magenta at the uh, temporary settings, we see that it does in fact have the ability to vary its instantaneous setting and it's currently set at the lowest point which one might think well we we need to slow it down to uh, coordinate and as we do that it uh, it actually slows it down but it and it changes the uh, the arcing current intersection point but it doesn't change the protection that we're being afforded by BL4 and then upstream by BL2. What it does change is if we have a fault on the upstream device, its ability, BL1 we're talking about now, its ability to uh, protect the devices downstream because it has its threshold set so far up. So just out of curiosity, let's go back and see. We're still trying to trace down the lack of coordination. Just out of curiosity, let's go back and see what, um, if we were to fault this bus in short circuit, what's the device that's going to be protecting our system? 
And what we see if, if uh, BL, or if the MCC DC bus faults, the upstream tripping device will be BL1. If BL1 trips, the upstream tripping device turns out to be the rectifier. Uh, and so, again, if we want BL1 to be in the system, there's gonna, we're just going to have to live with some miscoordination between BL1 and BL2. Now, that's, that's not necessarily the final answer, but that's one of the constraints we have when we look at hybrid systems, especially in the low voltage area. And, and it's, it's encumbered by the fact that we have relatively high operating currents in the DC system, and uh, the fault currents for an arcing fault in the DC system aren't excessively high compared to those load currents. Again, we'll touch on that more in a couple weeks when we talk more about the low voltage uh, arcing protection and arc modeling. Uh, but for now, let's go back and just kind of touch on the, the bullet points here. What we've done is verify that we have uh, the ability to do calculations in the DC side of the world for uh, arcing faults the ability to utilize the tools for sequence of events and plot the curves, um, and some modicum of a coordination. Uh, likewise, when we go into, let's go ahead and fault the buses again, we can generate the reports to include uh, low voltage, high voltage, and um, all the, all the reports for the DC side will be limited to just the half cycle current, and these can be generated for more data or less and include equipment duty. In terms of the uh, art calculations, once we go into the uh, arc flash hazard report, then we can go in and generate labels and it will bring up the information that we've calculated for each one of the DC buses in addition to the AC buses. Uh, so I, that kind of completes what we wanted to talk about today. I um, appreciate your time and attention. And uh, of course I've got, I set up my uh, demonstration today to, not include the uh, parameters for the arc flash label. So we'll catch that in two weeks. Did want to make the announcement that we are rolling out a new uh, web page for easypower.com that uh, we're, the intent is to make it easier to find the tutorials with specific uh, topics. We've also got, uh, in many cases, captions and uh, text of, available for uh, the webinars. So I encourage you to check out the new website sometime this week. You'll find we still have the instant on demos, announcements on the refreshers and the webinars, and some new regional training announcements uh, for later in the year. Thank everyone for attending today. And as I indicated, we'll respond to uh, all the questions via email before the end of the week. Have a good day.